Hey, welcome to Peep Show Talk Edition Number Six. Uh, the episode that I posted earlier on handcarts actually did really well. Uh, people seem to want to see what Zane uh, Moeller had to say about making handcart parts. So, uh, so now we're going back to just uh, rather than vendor, just a, a regular another MV collector, and we're going from one of the smallest military vehicles, handcarts, to tanks. So, welcome, John Shoup. Thank you, Tim. Happy to be here. Yeah. Okay. So uh, maybe give give yourself a little bit of an introduction, and just before I before you do that, John's one of the uh, recovery crew members, the uh, cast of characters that helped me go pick up uh, Peep, the slat girl that I own. <laughs> yes. So that was kind of a crazy day, especially when that guy hit my mirror. It was uh, it was very exciting. Yeah, it was a lot great, of fun. So anyway. T tell everybody kind of kind of how you got into this and what you have and what you've had. Okay. Um, well, it goes back into the uh, early 80s uh, when I got uh, my interest was uh, kind of sparked by uh, machine guns. I was a machine gun collector, a kind of a novice, and uh, I bought a few weapons and uh, started enjoying them. And um, uh, one of the first weapons that I bought, uh, I kind of ironically, was a 50 caliber Browning machine gun, an M2 heavy barrel, and uh, had a tripod, and we'd take it out and shoot it and have a good time, and uh, we did that a few times, and uh, a friend of mine suggested, wow, wouldn't it be cool if we could go mobile with this thing in a vehicle and take it out, ride around, and shoot it? Well, I started thinking about it, and a good friend of mine, Tony Petruso, here in St. Louis, and I were getting together one day, and I said, yeah, I want something to put this 50 on. And he says, oh, I got the perfect thing for you. And uh, he pointed me in the direction of a M114, which was a Vietnam era uh, recon track uh, that was used by uh, a lot of uh, armored cab units to go out and do recon with. So I promptly went out and found one that was kind of a derelict and uh, started restoring it. To make a long story short, I, I built two of these machines and I had a lot of fun with them. And, a, and an acquaintance of mine uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, Mike Brown, some of you may be uh, familiar with Mike. He owned a company in, in Louisville called Group Industries. He was pretty famous for building machine guns. Uh, he invited me to an event at uh, Fort Knox. Uh, every five years, they do Life of the Soldier, and it's a World War II themed event. And I didn't know anything about World War II vehicles, I had Vietnam era stuff. So he gave me a uniform and encouraged me to come and uh, put me in the bow gun position on an M3 Stewart tank. And I had a total blast. We, we were there for the whole weekend and uh, I had a newfound appreciation for World War II armor and um, promptly came back to St. Louis and made arrangements to dispose of the 114s and acquire a Stewart. That started, okay. um, that started the whole thing for me. Mm -hmm. So then you had a Stuart tank, and then was that one restored or not restored? I, no, I no that I decided that I didn't want an M3 after spending the weekend, and it's very difficult to get in and out of it. Uh, there aren't any uh, personnel hatches to, per se that you can just pop out of. So the M5 Stuart seemed like the, the choice for me. So there was one that other collector had down in uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. And it was purported to be about 70% restored. So we drove down one weekend, Mike and myself and Tim Garrett with the 14th Armored and uh, went to this old derelict warehouse. And there it was, it was blown apart in pieces. I mean, the turret was hanging from the ceiling. The hull was stripped. It was a dark, dingy place, parts everywhere. And I said, well, this, where's the 70% restored tank? And the guy said, well, this is it. I said, well, it uh, looks like 100% disassembled to me I, I don't see a lot of restoration <laughs> going on but a deal was struck and I bought it and um, we promptly uh, hired a truck and transported back to to uh, Shepherdsville Kentucky and the 14th armored crew uh, jumped on it and 14 months later we rolled it out it was fully restored front to back okay. and then somehow you ended up with uh, like another tank well yeah you know I mentioned I had the 114s. And uh, I had this 114 and I was looking for a buyer and um, there weren't many buyers at the time. 
Uh, I had a friend uh, in, um, in, in Tennessee that had a 114 and uh, we would communicate and suddenly he traded it for a Stuart tank. Now, when he traded it for a Stuart, I was really surprised because he owned a Christmas tree farm in Tennessee. And if anybody knows what Christmas tree farms look like, they're usually well manicured, very nice rolling hills with nice grass. And I knew the Stuart wasn't friendly. And I told him, I said, man, that thing's gonna tear your, your farm up. Well, within two weeks, he decided I was right and proposed to me a trade. So I traded a 114 for another Stuart. Uh, so now I had two. Um, the, well, the 14th crew in, in, in Kentucky jumped on it again. And uh, we had it, we had, it was running when I acquired it. So it was a running tank, but they did a lot of cosmetics and fixed a lot of things on it. So then two, and that was great. Uh, the wife was a little uh, concerned, but uh, she was very supportive after watching us restore the first one. So um, right. some years later, a oh, wait, there's more. Along, and uh, <laughs> there is more. There is more. Uh, a few years later, um, a friend of mine calls me and uh, wants to know if I'm interested in uh, purchasing a, a vehicle collection from a deceased collector down in Texas. And lo and behold, there's an M5A1 Stewart tank in the group. And I acquired that. So now I had three. So it, uh, it's getting a little out of control, but it was a lot of fun. And it, it has, has been a lot of fun. Yeah, well, one's a random purchase. Two is a collection. You know, three is... Uh, it's an addiction. It's an addiction, for sure. <laughs> and then you have, no some other you have some other vehicles also, don't you? Yeah, over that period of time, I was doing half tracks. I owned several half tracks. Um, Bought, sold, got them running, played with them. Uh, never really did a full restoration. Luckily, I got good, nice runners. Um, acquired uh, some two and a half ton trucks, some five ton trucks. I went through an addiction on uh, 931 uh, tractors. I had three of those. I was getting into all kind of crazy stuff. And uh, one day I woke up and said, hey, whoa, this is enough crazy. So uh, we started thinning the herd, so to speak. So today... I have a M5 high-speed tractor, artillery tractor. I've got one Stuart tank out of the three I had. I've got a really nice restored M3A1 half track, a freshly restored CCKW short wheelbase truck. It's just a wonderful truck, European return. I've got a World War II Jeep and some other accoutrements to kind of go with them. So I'm trying to pare back and get a little skinny, um, mm -hmm. getting older and... Uh, there's only so much time in the day that I want to spend working on vehicles. I just want to have fun driving them. So that's where I'm at right now. Now you also had like, uh, you were involved with some cannons. Is that right? 37 millimeters. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got, you know, I, because I had a Stuart and my guns on the Stuart were all live. Uh, they're all live 37 millimeter registered guns. Um, I got fascinated with the M3 uh, anti-tank gun, which was a uh, small tote. Uh, pre-war artillery piece and mm -hmm. uh so i uh picked up one of those and then um a friend of mine had a bunch of them he was selling and he asked me to help him sell them for him so i started doing some restorations with a friend of mine here in st louis and we started re restoring and selling these guns in unrestored condition we did that for several years i ended up with one gun it's a real nice restored uh, 37 it's, it's a live gun and uh, I take it to events and stuff, uh, tactical events, and I've taken it to Knob Creek machine gun shoot, fired it live on the range. It's been a lot of fun. It's small enough that one guy can maneuver it. I was fascinated with 57 millimeter guns, but they're very heavy. One guy cannot move one around. And uh, mm -hmm. so that kind of shot it for me. So I've still got my 37. I've I've played with one yeah, cool, before man. also, and actually the dent in the back of my GPW yeah, you came have. from one. So okay, speaking of, I remember of, that gun. Yeah, yeah, I think it's still there. It's at the military academy, but um, okay. Uh, this this is yeah, this is the, was nicely the thing done, that too. I mentioned that I wasn't going to tell you about. Uh, did you hear the story about this guy in England who had a little problem with his uh, his fifty seven millimeter round? No, I. I'm not aware of it at all. Okay. I need now you're a retired <laughs> firefighter. I am. 
And so you've, you've probably been on tens of thousands of calls and seen a lot in your day. And you also understand the artillery and a tank side of things. Okay. Yes. So this, this is from December 4th, 2021. It's from uh, Insider Magazine, although it's been picked up by others. Bomb squad, squad called to ER after a man turned up with a World War II artillery shell. Well, let's just say it was in his body. And it was a guy. Oh, very interesting. Okay. So uh, apparently it's a 57 millimeter, six pounder shell. Man presented at uh, emergency room with munition. And he said he was moving it. He slipped and fell and it ended up inside of him. Hmm. So do you, are you well, buying that story? story. Uh, <laughs> no. No, I don't buy that story. <laughs> I, I can't. I can't imagine. But hey, you know, uh, uh, he's got to have a story. So that one kind of fits his situation. So I don't know. I, I would think uh, he needs to find other things to do with his spare time. Yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe he needs a different collection of things. I don't I think know. so. You know, anyway. I, I I understand. Yeah, every there's a lot of interesting folks out there no sure. judgment no judgment no judgment not no at all. judgment I'm, i hope it all worked out for the guy yeah i heard that story and i was like what like <laughs> like and i've seen i've seen a 57 millimeter round it's not exactly small no no there's nothing small about it um but hey man you know Whatever trips your trigger, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, literally in this uh, case. Um, yeah. Okay, so yeah. what are kind of the pluses and minuses of owning a tank? Okay, well, first of all, there is the um, the fun factor, and you know, it to me, it's it's a great experience to get out in your armor and drive it around and enjoy it. Um, that's that's very attractive to me. Um, as far as tanks go, it's a it's a little bit of a task because you're dealing with something extremely heavy. Uh, it's tracked. It's not wheeled. So you really have to move it um, on a trailer everywhere. And what I always used to tell guys, they said, well, why did you, um, why did you key on the steward? Wouldn't you like to have a Sherman? Well, at the time, you know, I was uh, you know, 25 years young, um, working on the fire department on, on a regular shift basis. Uh, which put me in about a 56 hour week. I was a busy guy. And, um, you know, uh, it was expensive to move a Sherman triple axle trailer, triple axle truck, wide load, very expensive. Um, the steward will, will transport behind a dump truck on a float. If a guy has a little dozer, he's using to uh, cut holes in the ground for homes. He can pull it around with his own dump truck. And that's, Sure, will fit right on that trail. And I had several friends in the business here in St. Louis that have construction equipment, and they very casually move the steward. It's, 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 it's not a wide load. It's mm -hmm. 16 tons. It's very manageable. So I used to call it the working man's tank. This was a regular Joe's tank that, could, through friends and associates and people that know you, you could get transported, get it to a place where you could enjoy it. World War II weekend is a is a good example up in Jefferson Barracks. I had friends that hauled stuff for me up there. Uh, not so easy with the Sherman. Uh, also, the entry level price on a Sherman is uh, was a lot of my uh, my league. Uh, so I never really got fascinated with the big stuff, and I was just very happy with the small stuff. Number two or number three, I guess that would be uh, maintenance and serviceability. They're pretty spread. V8 carbureted uh, automobile engines, mm -hmm. Cadillac flatheads, pretty simple to work on, pretty simple to keep running. Not so much with the, 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 the big, bigger tanks that sometimes have radial engines and other complications. So mm -hmm. it just seemed like a choice for me. I was a working guy and it could, I, I fit it into my budget. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I ended up with Stewart's. Yeah, you don't have to go on the back and, and crank the engine, what, like 50 times before you start? No, you don't. You don't have to wind it up, you know, put a big key winder in it. You just um, basically uh, turn your ignitions on, hit the starter buttons. And those, uh, if, the, if they're properly tuned and they're properly maintained, those engines fire right up and away you go. 
Very what, simple. What kind of what kind of facility do you need to just maintain something like that? Like 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 well, what, what what's the logistics trail? Outside. Huh? Logistics on these is 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 fairly simple. You know, people always mention spare parts and how do you find spare parts? Well, since General Motors designed the engine engine package, there's a lot of parts out. They don't have to be military. The, the point condensers and all the different things that are they're part of this tank are readily available. Spark plugs, etc. Um, there's lots of good manuals available. Uh, you know, they wrote those manuals for 18 year old kids. They, they weren't that awfully mechanical to repair them with, and uh, so it kind of they work well today. Um, logistics, getting it inside a garage is a big deal, and that's one thing I've never owned. I've never had my own facility where I could take stuff to and park it in and work on it. I've always relied on the 14th Armored Motor Pool in uh, Shepherdsville, Kentucky, and um, uh, that's going to change uh, with the new year. I'm going to have my own uh, building, and I'll be able to my stuff inside and work on, which is going to be a big plus, even this late in my collecting career. It, it's a big, uh, exciting thing for me. And um, so, you know, uh, it's pretty, pretty simple. Once you get it moved where you want to work on it, it's easier if you can do it inside. But, you know, a lot of repairs are done outdoors. They were done outdoors all the time in mm -hmm. World War II. So uh, I've done them in the field in France. I've, I've crawled under them. I've, you know, I've done it all over the world. So uh, it's not a big deal. Yeah, the one guy that restored the Stug Three in England, I think he he did everything entirely outside. Yeah, if you just if you can just get some shelter over the top of you, like a a canopy or some type of uh, shade, uh, mm -hmm. that that's a big deal. It's a big deal. Okay, but, now you've uh, taken your tanks to Europe. You took you took one of your I have one of your tanks to Europe. So I know there's probably more involved with it than just putting putting a bunch of stamps on it and drop it off the post office. Oh yeah, so what does it take yeah. to take your tank to Europe and, and well, get it back? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how we did it. Um, back in 2004, we did a television show for uh, the National Geographic Channel. Uh, it was about people that own tanks. And I was one of the, I think, five or six featured people on the show that owned tanks. And we did the show, filmed at Fort Knox. It was seen uh, all over the world. And I um, had a friend of mine, well, he's a friend of mine now, had a, had a gentleman contact me from England. Um, he said, you need to come and join us on one of our trips. It was second armored in Europe, John, John Hayworth. And uh, so I, the next year I flew over to... Uh, the UK and met with them at uh, Beltring, which is their big military vehicle rally. And uh, they convinced me to show up in 2006. So I went to work. I came home, got with my crew, and uh, we decided we would take two tanks and two Jeeps, uh, myself, uh, Mike Brown, Perry Locke, the, the, the three of us decided we'd pool our vehicles and um, take them over. So um, we figured that a steward tank would clear the sides of a standard shipping container by an inch and a half on each side. We could drive it right in. Very, very tight clearance, but it would go. Uh, the, the problem was the height. We had to get the what they call a high cube container, which is a little higher than standard. Mm -hmm. And we got two 40-foot containers. We could put one tank and one Jeep in each container, tie them down, get them ready to go and ship them. Um, had to get... Um, licenses from the uh, State Department uh, through the Arms Control Division, the same people that export fighter planes and tanks all over the world for the US government took our case and uh, we filled out the forms and they gave us permits so that we could clear customs to and from the United States, excuse me, to France and then back to the United States. So um, we got all the, the paperwork cleared, uh, got permits from, uh, from the English, correction from the French French government and we put them in the containers and shipped them from Louisville they put them in these 40 footers uh, we locked them up they went by rail from Louisville to Norfolk Virginia uh, they offloaded there into a cargo ship and they were shipped to La Havre France and then they were picked up by trucks in the in the containers and taken to um, Cannes to the Carpiquet military base uh, which is a 
adjacent to uh, the city. And they, the, the French army was going to store our containers for us and keep them in safe storage until we could arrive to come and unload them and take the tanks and Jeeps with us. And that's how we did it. Uh, it worked beautifully. Um, I think it took about a week or like eight days to get the tanks from Louisville actually and have them in France. Um, we used them. We uh, did an event with the second armored in Europe, uh, put a couple hundred miles on them over an 11 day period of time. And then we put them back in the containers and proceeded to ship them back. Shipping back was a little more difficult. Uh, it wasn't quite as speedy. Some shipping company I, I'm not even aware of somehow got possession of our containers and tried to hijack them for some money, for some fees. And so let's just say it took us just over a week to get them to France. It took us almost three months to get them back. Um, and then the final straw was U.S. Customs and uh, Homeland Security uh, in um, in uh, uh, the United States. They they quarantined our containers uh, on import at Norfolk and told us they were going to undergo a special inspection uh, for agricultural purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, we had steam tanks prior to put them in the containers, but they said it's we have to inspect them. So. Um, about two weeks later, I got a call from customs and they said, well, one of your containers escaped. Uh, we released it accidentally. It's in Louisville. We've quarantined it there. We're still going to do the inspection. It's like, hey, man, it's been two weeks. What's going on? Yeah. Uh, finally, after. Meanwhile, you're paying days, for a container. Oh, oh, $100 a day, 100 yeah. bucks a day per container. So. Uh, finally, from customs, well, your stuff is cleared. Uh, the trucking company uh, calls me and says, hey, your stuff is here at our trucking lot in Louisville. And I said, well, I'd like you to deliver them today so we can unload them. And the guy said, well, you know, we're kind of busy. And I said, no, man, I need them today. I'm tired of paying on them. And so they brought them over, backed them up into our warehouse. And uh, lo and behold, the seals that I put on them in France were still intact. Customs never did inspect them, but they did delay the shipment by... 30 days, which cost me several thousand dollars extra. Thank you very much, U.S. Customs and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Homeland Security. Uh, but we did get them back and uh, everything was intact, just like we had put it in there. We were just so happy to get everything back again. And uh, everything was safe and sound at that point. Mm -hmm. Would so, you do it again? It was good. I would do it again. My wife asked me the same question. I wrote a, a pretty large check. Uh, to the shipping company. We had uh, indications earlier on that the shipping company was gonna comp us for this relative to the event that we were uh, involved in, or at least we're gonna pick up some of the expense. Mm -hmm. They would let us in a specific direction. And uh, of course, all that fell apart at the end. And uh, so I wrote a check and my wife says, oh, wow, you know, um, but would, would you do this ever again? And I'm like, yeah, I'd do it. It was, it was fabulous. My son was with me, Perry's son was with him. They got to drive across France. Um, we were all in the we were in the field for eleven days, um, camping in the actual camping areas where the Second Armored uh, camped during the breakout uh, from Normandy. So yeah, it was it was pretty epic. And uh, yeah, yeah, I would do it again. Okay. Okay. It was, so it was great. Yeah, I, I think it sounds like a blast. And you actually went back later on as part of a Hellcat. I've done, group. I've done six trips in Europe with these guys uh, out of England, um, uh, all over uh, Europe in, in, the, in the theater. Uh, we, we didn't ever do anything in Italy, but we, France, Germany, then Belgium, Holland, uh, Czech Republic, I've done six trips total, including this one. Mm -hmm. So five additional trips and seen a lot of Europe and uh, met a lot of really great people and done some fabulous uh, living history events. Yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Wow. Yeah, sounds, sounds like a good time. Um, so let's let's go to our hot topic question. Whenever a tank comes up for sale, somebody always says, "Oh man, if I just win the lottery, I could go buy that tank." What's your advice? To I, I say, if you're interested in it and you can accept all of the responsibilities and uh, issues relative, if you're mechanically inclined. If doing the events, if you move it around, if you can 
I mean, if you, if you want to own one of these things, you really want to enjoy it. And I say yes. Um, however, now there are lots of collectors that don't care about moving them around. They don't care about taking them to events. They, they just enjoy them sitting in their building. Uh, they have their own little museums and stuff. And that's great. I have no problems with that. But that's just not me. I like to run them, drive them, have a good time with them. Um, and I say go for it. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. You meet a lot of great people. You get invited to a lot of a lot of cool places, and uh, it's just a lot of fun. It's just um, a lot of fond memories, a lot of really great memories with that with those machines, for sure. I, I would think that if you're going to do something like that, you would at least need to have a collection of people who are there to help you. Oh, that's that's other. critical. I agree. I I had a collection of people. I still do. Um, we had a very active group in in Louisville, Kentucky. It, we did we did events together in Florida. We, we transport our tanks to Florida. We've taken them all over the place, and uh, very active group. But in that twenty plus years, these guys get older. They go to college, or they get married, and they got kids, and their interests go in a different way. It's hard to keep a hardcore group of guys together for that length of time. And all of us in this group that are still there have gotten a lot older, and we we're, we don't do what we used to do, and. Uh, it's difficult. If you're a one man band, you better have a lot of spare time and a lot of motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've got a team, I always, I, I sold a tank to a guy recently and um, he, he's got a team. He's got his own group of guys that are going to crew the tank. And I told him how much easier it is when you've got a, a crew that will, will all commute, kind of get together periodically, do some work, take the tank out, crew it. Um, that's critical. It is really critical. Yeah, but, I've uh, always thought rather than, you know, if I did win the lottery, I would go more the direction of a Greyhound M8 uh, armored car than a tank just because you're not dealing with the tracks. Uh, one person can kind of drive it and deal with it, although, you know, it's a crucial weapon. But at least you can yeah, do more, more of the basic stuff I've, by yourself. On these, these different events I've done, gone into the Czech Republic to do with friends, I've only taken a vehicle of my own one time. That was in 2006. Subsequently, I did five additional events over the next 10 or 12 years. And I've crewed an M18 Hellcat, um, M8 armored car, predominantly. Um, the one thing I've noted about the M8, it, once you get it restored and all the systems are working well, because it's all hydraulic, everything is controlled is hydraulic, um, it's difficult to drive by yourself. And the reason I, I mentioned that is because your vision on the sides is, is completely gone. Uh, mm -hmm. Essentially, you're a forward-looking driver. You can put some mirrors up on the front and you can kind of get a look around, but you cannot turn your head to the left or right. Right, really because you're basically in like anything. a box like this. A box, yeah. So you really, really need a co-pilot. You need somebody up in the, in the turret or in the case of the M20, uh, back in the crew compartment, that can look over his shoulder and look left and right and guide mm -hmm. you. And uh, that's why it's critical also on these crude weapons uh, platforms is to have a, a working functioning intercom system so that you can put on your uh, earpieces and microphones and talk directly to the driver, talk to other crew members, tell them, you know, watch out on the left, give it, you know, if you're in a tank, you can tell the driver left track, right track. He knows what that means. And you can keep everybody out of trouble. Um, yeah, the, time, the, time I've spent, the time I've spent in your tank, actually, you know, you, you guys run everything original World War II. Um, and yes. including the intercom. Then actually, the, the World War II stuff does not work that bad at all. I was pretty impressed with it. I mean, it, it's not. Not at all. It, it's not exact. You know, it's a, not a modern system, but you can hear people and. Yeah, it works. It works fine. Yeah, the guys have spent a lot of time keeping those amplifier systems going. Um, we also um, try to maintain radios so that we can talk vehicle to vehicle. But the World War II radios, the biggest problem with them are the crystals. The crystals have all deteriorated and pretty much died. So it's very difficult to keep those working, even if all the electronics are working properly. But every one of our armored vehicles has a working World War II intercom. Mm -hmm. All the 
all the stations are installed for communication so you can plug in and talk and um that's that's critical that's a that's a huge safety issue that we uh we're, we really, really feel strongly about is uh, good communications yeah and some other people have tried some bluetooth things and some other and yeah well i had a i had an opportunity to go to the czech republic uh in 2015 um for the um liberation uh party and all the activities uh for in, in pilsen um so we did uh, 11 days on the road there and and actually the czech german reenactors would spar with us us they would amb pull ambushes and they probe us at night it was really an interesting uh living history reenactment that, that lasted for 11 days but i was asked uh, i was I, they said well you're going to be in a steward i said that's great that, that was that's my home i love the steward and uh, they, then all of a sudden i got an email that said oh we're putting you in a hellcat well, i didn't know anything about a hellcat I, I know it's a track vehicle and i know what it's supposed to, i know the history of it but it's like i'd never crewed one before so I was kind of curious, why did I get switched? And apparently the owner of the Hellcat uh, was an English gentleman that did not have a lot of uh, stick time with the Hellcat. He hadn't been, hadn't put, he'd owned it for several years, but hadn't driven it much. So they wanted somebody that was experienced uh, with operating tracked armored vehicles to be on it with him. So I was kind of, I began, became the commander. First thing I asked him on a phone call was, do you have working intercom? Oh yes, we're all good. Working intercom's fine. I get there. It's these little Bluetooth headsets. And you couldn't hardly hear anything through them. They were almost useless. And I said, no, that's not an intercom. So I took up the co-driver's seat next to him. And I told him, I said, you just key on me. I'm going to keep an eye on you. We're not going to hit anything. It's all going to be good. And uh, so we had total success. Uh, the, the tank performed marvelous, I should say, the the tank destroyer performed marvelously and uh, we didn't hit anything and by the end of the trip with a couple hundred miles under his belt he was very proficient at operation mm -hmm. so it worked out well but the bluetooth intercoms not a big fan not a big fan i think you guys actually on um, one of your trips actually did strike a building yeah we were there in 06 uh we had a platoon of four m5a ones two of them came from the uk we brought the other two um they were the lead tanks. They were fresh restorations. They didn't have a lot of uh, mileage on them. And so they, they were having teething problems and the drivers themselves uh, were uh, somewhat inexperienced, but we're going through a French village one day and um, it was early morning, the roads were wet and uh, our platoon always ran in specific order, one through four. So we were three and four in the back. Uh, we noticed that the tank in the second position slid out of control sideways on the uh, cobblestones and struck a building and um, of course that was you know very shocking and we stopped immediately and we dismounted to make sure everybody was okay and um, it's it hit the front of this stone house right at the front door the guy had some real nice french doors there with a, a stone uh cornice and everything and, and threshold and they broke the threshold and broke the cornice broke the doors out it was all destroyed you know and everybody in the tank was okay well this little french guy comes running out of the building and he he throws his hands up in the air and he keeps repeating la char la char you know and he starts hugging some of our guys you know it's like uh, wow what's going on so the uh we had a French interpreter come show up. And then, of course, the French police showed up. Turns out the guy was a French uh, tank crewman and had put in some time in Algeria in, in, a, in an American-made tank that the French were using. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he thought it was fascinating that this tank would hit his house because he was a tanker. And he was posing for pictures with everybody and it, it all worked out great. We had insurance. It wasn't a problem, but uh, nobody got hurt. But it was pretty funny to see this guy smiling and grinning very broadly while he was hugging all the tank crewmen after it crashed into his house. <laughs> that 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 just it was it was pretty cool. It was. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I would say that, that that's definitely a living history moment or, uh, it, you know, because that ha that stuff happens. It does. And, you know, people don't realize um, at a certain speed, maybe with certain conditions and these cobblestones, which are kind of smooth when they're wet, 
uh, that, you know, and, and maybe you're not uh, as familiar with operating the tank as you should be, but you change your steering position a little bit and the tank starts to slide a little. Well, that's a lot of weight, you know, a lot of momentum there. And uh, it just slid right into the house. Uh, so uh, mm-hmm. yeah, lessons there, learned. Yeah. There was a, few, a couple of years ago, a guy was loading his uh, replica Stug to bring to an event here in Missouri and it slipped off the trailer. And then next thing you know, now he's got you know, uh, 10,000 tons or 10, you know, 10 tons of vehicle sitting, sitting half on a trailer, half off a trailer. And, and, uh, you know, I think he was partially blocking a road maybe and some other stuff. So it can, it can go wrong really quick if you don't know what you're doing. So yeah, we, um, I had one time during, during this whole thing, I had a, my own transport truck and, uh, one of my, one of the principals of our unit was, was pulling, uh, one of my tanks up on the trailer and, um, for some reason, and, uh, they figured out later, uh, that the throttles stuck on the tank. And so the, the competency there was there with the driver. He went immediately for the ignitions to shut the ignitions down and, um, these little ignition toggles, which are very common on half tracks and whatnot, actually broke free from the switches and the engines didn't shut off. So he hard sticked it to the right to try to drive off the trailer and ended up not quite making it. He went off the trailer sideways and the tank went over on its side. Ooh. And of course, uh, a fire started in the engine compartment. So he scrambled out uh, once he got himself uh, reorganized and uh, they got everything was okay. Uh, they turned the tank back over, had a couple tractors and pulled it back. But uh, it's not something I would want to do. And I'm sure uh, this particular guy that did it doesn't want to ever repeat it either. He said all he could all he could see was running over the cab of the truck. And he, he didn't think he wanted to do that. So he pulled it off to the side and over it went. So there are some hazards involved with this stuff. You never know. <laughs> yeah. So, again, go back to the if you win the lottery and you, you're, you're sure you want to buy a tank, uh, you know, that this is what can happen. Yeah. Why not? I mean, you know, if, if you win the lottery and you've got some extra cash, um, why not do something, you know, a little out of the ordinary and have some fun with it? it uh, it's really rewarding and it's a lot of fun. And, and, you know, I have to say, if you win the lottery and, and you have a lot of money, you may find you don't have time to mess around with tanks. I mean, I don't know what your interests are, but certainly you've got the flexibility to, to go out and purchase one if you, if you want to and have some fun with it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, hey, uh, I think this has been a really kind of fun episode. And uh, John, thanks for thanks for taking some time you to uh, you bet, get Tim. Out here and let us know what's going on with your projects and stuff. And, uh, you know, thanks for tuning into this episode. And... Uh, of the peep show and i will see you on the next one